All right, everyone, and welcome to episode six of the newly renamed How Are The Hops podcast. I'm Chris from How Are The Beers on Instagram, and I am joined, as always, by David and Alex from The Hop Guys on Instagram. Today, we're joined by Ben and Mike from Riverton. So before we get cracking with our first beer lads, do you just want to introduce yourself and, and your role at the brewery? I've never heard Riverton and Geordie accent before. It's amazing. <laughs> 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 what an intro. Uh, yeah, I'm Ben. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I, oh, yeah. Yeah. My, uh, I tend to do like pretty much well less of everything now, but uh, brewing, um, admin, sales, um, a little bit of accounts that I can't do, deliveries, um, that sort of thing. Cask wash, but not done that for a little bit either. So yeah, just a bit of everything to be honest. Yeah, and I'm, I'm one of the founders along with Mike. <laughs> yeah, I'm Mike, and uh, I'm more the farming side. So. Look after the beasts and stuff like that, and um, yeah, generally, and just on jobs, on jobs, we stuff breaks. Brewery, yeah. Give Mike a shout, and he'll usually sort it out. So yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like chicken That's stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Um, right, so we'll get cracking with this first beer. Do one of you want to introduce the beer and have talk a little bit about it? Yeah, cool. Oh. Got um, never known fog light. Yeah, so <laughs> good. Never known fog light. Which <laughs> is. Our by far biggest selling beer in keg and cam. Uh, so we brewed it uh, four years ago this summer slash spring, I think, yeah. four years ago. Yeah. Um, and it was at the time when, <laughs> when, we, it when we'd first start to see hazies and New England and stuff sort of coming to the UK, mainly like Cloud Water and Magic Rock at the time doing them. Um, and we're like, yeah, we, we need to do this. So yeah, we first brewed it on our old brewery with flat bottom, dish bottom fermenters, um, threw a load of hops in, uh, bottle conditioned it, and then it just came out like murky brown because it all oxidized initially in our first batch. Um, and gradually, yeah, it's just, it's sort of, but when it was kegged, it, it was decent and it built up a reputation from there, like especially locally. Um, and we sort of, we changed the water on it a bit well, depending on the sort of what we're getting in our water at different times of the year. And we changed the malt bill slightly when we moved on to our new brewery. But apart from that, yeah, it's our, it's our core beer. Um, yeah, people seem to quite like it. Yeah, that's class. <laughs> David, <laughs> Alex, uh, what are you thinking? Because I know what I think of it, because I've tried Fog before. <laughs> it's proper <laughs> crushable, isn't it? Like, you could easily see off a load of those this a nice yeah. little bitterness helps it go down, but it's super smooth. It honestly, like, like Chris was saying, it kind of drinks a little bit like a deep It's nice, thick. Yeah, yeah there's been a few people said that. Like, well, the hopping rate on up at what twenty? Yeah, almost thirty grams a liter on the dry hop on it, um, and then like massive protein bill on it. And yeah, I think a lot of people seem to quite like that. It's it's the only beer we hop during active fermentation still. Um, and then we used Chinook in it, which if I'm honest, we used it because that's the hops we could get at the time. So it was like um, Chinook, Simcoe, Mosaic, and then Simcoe, Mosaic, Citra in the dry hop. Um, so yeah, I think that Chinook still brings a little bit of the bitterness and like pininess at the end. Because um, for ages we were sort of like trying to get these no bitterness, incredibly soft beers. Um, and yeah, in fact, like we sort of actually enjoyed a little bit of bitterness in it as well. Um, and uh, the originals, I guess, like New England, sort of Alchemist, Heady Top and stuff, they're still quite bitter beers as well. They've just sort of gone incredibly. I think they can be soft and bitter, but they've gone like zero bitterness. Mm. Yeah. I think the bitterness adds that depth to it as well and flavour, yeah. which I think could be missing. It wouldn't be, I don't think, it certainly wouldn't be the same beer about it. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Pinch, especially for New England as well, you do need that, that pinch and like you say, that pineiness behind it. Yeah. Yeah, I literally can't, exactly. I can't put it down for like 30 seconds without just <laughs> straight back to it, to be honest. Yeah. Like, that is like one of the most crushable things I've had in, it in a long time. Like, no, oh, cheers. Yeah, it's funny. We've not drank, I haven't drank a lot of it this year. We had it in sensory the other day and we sort of forgot how hoppy it is. <laughs> how, yeah. like, yeah, it, like I say, almost drinks like a dipper at times. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but. Uh, oh, yeah. honestly, I was, I was saying to the lads before we started was, um, because I, I, I don't think you guys have tried fog before, have you? No, no, so no. Saying, kind of get ready for something that if you blind tasted it, it there's no way it's a 5.2 pale. If you blind tasted it, if you didn't know what it was, it's, yeah. it's got so much more body and depth of flavour and like 
it's just yeah it's I'm, I'll put it out there and I'll say it's probably my favourite pale of like no. ever thank uh, you very much <laughs> uh, you know I'm not yeah. <laughs> it's, it is it's just brilliant it's just absolutely brilliant yeah. pale I think it's just yeah which comes like, with the which comes like with a, the name because obviously yeah. it's they're all quite strange and weird and Ooh. wonderful yeah, yeah I think we'd watch Steve was off uh, the PTK uh, car show I think <laughs> he's <laughs> Keeping the Bolton roots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I think it was his grandmother who said something about I've never seen rain like it or something. Yeah, and yeah we, we kind of played with that a bit. Yeah. Um, it was ironic as well. We called it that. And then I think like a year or so after, we became aware of London Fog Yeast. We used London 3 in this. And we're like, oh, shit, the, the yeast be named after it. But in fact, the yeast had been there for, for quite a while. So, <laughs> like, yeah. How do you. Um, because I've I've noticed, and I, I don't know if I'm if I'm wrong. And someone pointed out it was on Instagram. Was you know your your double IPAs? Yeah. Are they named after horror movies? Yes. Yeah. 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 They said we tried to go. Well, it's make that started it with like Evil Dead because it was a series we're doing with Chain House. So once like Evil Dead, Evil Dead Two, Evil Dead Three, mm -hmm. um, and then we sort of we were trying to keep them like not as in your face horror films. If that makes sense. Huh. Um, like yeah, so we went with yeah. that sort of thing. Um, we were gonna, I suppose, the second Evil Dead was. We, did, uh, could we, we debate that. So we did Evil Dead. We did Evil Dead Two, but Evil, the film Evil Dead Two is uh, Dead Before Dawn. And um, we thought, yeah, maybe not in the middle of a pandemic. Do we call it being <laughs> Dead Before Dawn? It's probably, probably not the right way to go. Really. <laughs> Are you just big horror fans? Like, yeah. Um, I, a little bit, yeah. They, were, yeah. they were more kind of like the B, B movies that we kind of went for that kind yeah. of um, that kind of genre kind of thing. Yeah. Um, no, I always enjoyed but, them. Like, yeah, so, not watch them as much with like two young kids and going to bed at ten o'clock now. But I used to <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, love horror films. So, yeah, right. it's funny though, isn't it? Like with the name, we do cause we've done a few names off of like songs and things, and even like really obscure songs or like a really obscure like word for something you go untapped and someone knows what it is or tweets you about it like i think like broken amps is off a nas song um and then someone on, is untapped check-in was like the whole lyrics to the verse <laughs> so, like, <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> someone's found it that's almost like a little challenge for all your fans isn't it to try and yeah. find out where this has come from Answer well, pretty much yeah we just <laughs> like, we've, quite interesting, yeah. we've got we've just sent labels today to the printers for a beer we've done which like it's a random name if anyone gets it from the famous tv show i'll be very impressed <laughs> but i'm no doubt someone will do so. <laughs> yeah. and yeah oh i'm not even gonna ask you to tell me what it is because you won't be allowed yet will you keep it secret the what the the beer or the uh the name Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Shy Ben's got no man. Wait, ask. What was the name of it? <laughs> Wait, let me just get the name completely right. But uh, it's for a, a was that a DDH that one or? Um, yes, Pro probably DDH. Yeah, uh, that was DDH. Definitely. And the name of it was just how unorganised we are with names. We're supposed to have it in a week ago, and we got it in today to <laughs> to be done. So. Uh, the name of it is. Uh, drum roll, do you want a drum roll? I can put an effect on it. I've got to scroll <laughs> through it. Uh, <laughs> the, no, the, it's the other yeah, one. the guy was interior decorator. Can't you recognise it, Nat? <laughs> Someone will get it, I think, hopefully. Oh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's for a, a DDH fail. Surprise. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, there's nothing, nothing better than a, it's for a mild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not wrong than the when it's getting in the sunny weather and that one is this. You can't yeah, exactly. Smacking back double after double. Yeah. Um, when it's uh, hot outside. What's your guy? What's your guys' thought on this whole the massive ABV beers going around at the minute? Because it's just there's just tippers flying around left, right, and centre, isn't it? Yes. We yeah we were discussing this with the other day yeah. and we thought there might be a little bit of a more trend back towards the four or five percent of this summer. Yeah, um, I think when cast comes back out as well. Like, yeah, I think people will be wanting that more sessionable beer. I think. Yeah. Um, I guess it's a bit different when you're at home and you're drinking at home. You want something special, don't you? And something. Yeah. Um, a little bit different and. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's just... It's, I mean, someone's not going to come to the tap and have a pint of a dipper well, and then... Well, I think, yeah, you dictated. I mean, we can, we, we serve dippers in thirds and halves at the tap room. Yeah. Um, I think it's also, you've then got your range. You can, we've got 17 taps here. We've got two casks and five, 15 keg lines. Mm-hmm. Now, for you to get 17 beers at home of 440 mils or 500s would cost you a small fortune, whereas you can come to, like, the tap room and have thirds and half. So I still think there'll be a place for them, but I don't think it'll be as much. I mean, we're going to, we've got another dipper scheduled for two weeks' time or three weeks' time, and we'll still put the majority of that into can, and we'll get maybe 10, 12 kegs off it, which probably half will come to the tap room and then we'll send, sell to a few customers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, and I guess as part of lockdown, it's allowed breweries to sort of like push what the breweries can do a bit more, which is pretty exciting because normally we wouldn't, um, wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it'd be interesting when stuff reopens. Like, you know, you, you, won't, well, you, you probably wouldn't want to reopen with four dippers, five tippers on, and maybe a quipper. <laughs> like, you'd, yeah. uh, you wouldn't have many, uh, many customers like left standing. So, um, but yeah, I think it's, I don't know, it's a bit of, we were sort of chatting about this the other day, like I guess it's like the, the beer industry in the UK maturing to an extent as well. Like if you, I think it's, we're finding more and more now breweries doing a whole range of styles. Mm-hmm. Um, like one of our favourite styles, one of the first we ever did and still continue to do with Saison's. Um, yeah. We can sell reasonably well at our tap room, but to sell to trade, we sell next to nothing keg wise. Like it'll take us six months to sell an active Saison and we can sell a dipper in a week. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's now as consumers are getting a bit more and sort of um, like I guess mature like you know sort of trying different styles and things that I think yeah it's we're probably going through a phase at the moment where sort of chasing dippers and tippers but there's going to be more and more styles that are going to be appreciated I think a lot of stuff is it's, it's seasonal as well so in the middle of winter impy stouts and dippers you sort of don't mind and comes summertime when you want to be outside in the sun and you maybe just want a, like a good few pints of four percenter or or a saison or a whip beer or a lager it just i know for us it definitely changes seasonally and even what we're drinking sort of changes definitely. like over the year like the, you know a couple of summers ago all i drank was kettle sours pretty much for the whole summer um and then i got a little bit fatigued with that and then i drank ddh's solidly for the following summer and again i got hot <laughs> fatigue a bit so i was like well start drinking stouts a bit more and stuff. And then strangely, even though it's not the summer, I've drank more lagers from January till now than I ever have. Um, I don't know if it's just because we've maybe given ourselves a bit of hop fatigue that mm-hmm. we sort of appreciated that. But now I've drank a load of lagers. I'm like, oh, actually I kind of want hops again, and, but mm-hmm. maybe not as many as a DDH. So I want like a nice 4% pale I can have a load of. Yeah. We, we talked about the Cody on a, on a um, podcast a little, a little while back and we were thinking, surely this isn't going to be the new kind of trend coming through because yeah. the, the, the year, well, we kind of thought that it was the year of the tipper was kind of last year. People kind of flexing the muscles a bit and yeah. showing, showing what they can do. But I think we really thought that the, the quads were just a, an extra special thing. People are just trying to one up on someone else and it couldn't really, couldn't really take off. But I think it, what you've said, like people obviously want something a bit more special at home and, and why not produce a load yeah, of tippers yeah. when people are at home and if they, if they want one nice beer to last them a little bit longer than smashing a load of cheap cans and then yeah. more beer, you know? And if there's demand for it as well, exactly. That, that, that's the big thing. Like, it's it's funny, like, I've seen beer Twitter this week and, you know, people kicking off about certain styles again and whatever else, but there's demand for it. And I hate this idea of people being chastised because they like a certain style, style of beer. If you like milkshake IPAs, like, brilliant. Like, they're not for me, but you yeah. never laugh at anyone because they like them. If you like... If you like tippers and drink them, like again, like brilliant, like you're getting enjoyment out of that beer. Who's just because someone on Instagram says you shouldn't be drinking them, like mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just almost, almost becomes a bit of a shame for the industry. Like I was chatting to someone else today, and um, I was saying like if if you just got into beer today for the first time ever, you'd walked into your local Tesco, you bought a punk IPA, you came home and drank it, and thought, wow, this is ace. Like this is completely different to what I've tried. I want to get into craft beer. Then you go on beer Twitter and you're like, fuck that. I'm not getting into this. Like, I don't even know where to start. Like, I don't know what I'm, I don't know. Should the beer be hazy? Should it be clear? Is it hoppy? Is it too hoppy? Should it be lactose in it? Should it not be lactose in it? And it's just, it sort of takes the fun away from it a little bit at times. 
I think if you got into um, into craft this year, you, your mind would just completely go. You, you wouldn't <laughs> yeah. know where to start and you could almost yeah. ruin and it. And what's yourself. right and what's wrong. Like. Yeah, exactly. Because like, you, you're doing, like, uh, we've we've all been drinking uh, craft beer for, for quite a while now and we know styles that we like and we know styles that we don't, but someone could just go up to the fridge and go, you know what, I don't know, so I'm just going to go one, one, one. And there could all be styles yeah. that they'll really hate. They might be like yeah. really too, really too hoppy for what they want, and they might want something a bit more like a, a Belgian style, yeah. something a bit more malty, maybe. And it, it might completely yeah. them off. So it's it's such a, a a trial and error thing at the start now. But at the same time, yeah. If you looked at if you looked at quite a lot of the reviews and and however many different types of pages there are like Untapped and stuff, it kind of helps. But I don't think people yeah. really know that. If you know what I mean, like I think pubs yeah. promote it a little bit, but not being open if you've only just got into it you, you wouldn't have a scooby yeah. do really i think if you, you forget it could be we've noticed here at the tap room it can be like intimidating for people for the first time like we've had people come in here who probably just drank like mass lager for years and they come in they look at the boards and they're like well have no idea what ddh even <laughs> stuff like stands for like <laughs> yeah, have no idea what it says on is and you can see them come up they're almost like nervous to ask because they don't want someone to like laugh at them for not knowing what the beer is and it's i think that's got to come like that you know people not being afraid to sort of speak at the point of purchase and chat about beer and educate people on beer there and yeah i think that's whole part of it yeah and when people come at the bar and they just glaze over when they see that big chalkboard and they're just like oh yeah, like, yeah where, where do i start <laughs> uh, like, number five eight, please isn't yeah eight percent <laughs> like yeah we still get it's still like by far the most common like northern phrase we get here is we never give someone a taster well when we could give tasters it was like yeah yeah it's nice it's lovely i couldn't have a pint of it though we're, like, we're not telling you to have a pint of it <laughs> just have a third if you want just try a third Class. i think i think uh talking about your tap room and things like that it'd be really interesting to see what the approach is of hunters just coming in buying seeing if they are are they going to follow that trend of drinking dippers and tippers yeah. or or like you say, are they going to go for that more sessionable one? I, I know <clears throat> for me personally, I, without a tap room, we're going to want to try probably four or five, even yeah. six different beers. So go for a third of a sessionable beer and just try as many as you can. Yeah, exactly. Actually, if you are going to somewhere like yours, where you've got, you say, 15 peg lines, which is... Yeah. So you, you want to try a good sample for me. But. Yeah, exactly. And that's what you can't, when you're buying four fourteen five 500 mil cans, you can't do at home. I mean, wait, well, you can. You could try, <laughs> but like, a it costs a lot, and by the end of fifteen, like pints of can, you'll yeah, yeah you probably know about it. So, yeah, I think, I think definitely, when people have that choice and variety out there again, I think, I think, um, I think more people are going to want to be trying, trying more lines, um, yeah, and probably tr potentially trying different stuff to what they do at home. I don't know if like. I know when I bought beers sort of online and stuff, you almost, I guess, less like to take a risk online. You sort of go to what you know a little bit more because you are buying a, a pint of something or you are buying 12 cans. So you want to have, you know, 10, 11 of those, you know, are going to be good, you're going to enjoy. Then maybe you get one that you're not too sure about, but you'll give it a try. Whereas a tap room, you'll have to take like a half or a third or something you've never, a style you've never had before. You don't know if you like and you'll take that risk on it. Yeah, absolutely. Out of interest, like we, I think we all noticed that you have 500 mil cans instead of yes. 440s, which I think is the, uh, which is like, well, it seems to be the almost the industry standard at the minute. Um, yeah. Is there a reason behind that? We didn't want to go with the industry standard, yeah. basically. <laughs> like, yeah, we uh, we saw 440s everywhere. So, we're like, well, it's just like, you know, it's going to help us stand out being sort of bigger cans. When we sort of shorter label on it and stuff as well. So, yeah, it's just, we, yeah, we always, we've always, We've tried as far as we can to sort of make our beer like we didn't ever want to be the most expensive and same like keg prices. We still want it to be like accessible. So we sort of thought we'd go for like bigger cans and still try and get them out at like a, a reasonable price point for what what we can afford as a brewery. Um, and just we thought, yeah, it'd be a little bit different with with so many pretty much everyone doing four forties. Let's go for for five hundreds. No, definitely. I think when you're saying there about price and that, I mean, there's, it's no no secret to anybody that craft beer is not cheap. You know, no. whether you buy it by the can or by the by the half or whatever, it's not a cheap yeah. you know, drink. But I think, well, I've, I've bought, you know, 
quite a few times now and you guys are really really fairly priced especially yeah. in what i would say like is the industry standard yeah um but yeah so it's i yeah that's good i think <laughs> it, it, it makes you guys stand out as well from the side of people who might be just getting into craft because obviously it gets to a point where kind of price is almost irrelevant but you would still prefer it to be cheaper yeah um but, but, but people get you know the it's industry. also like a um a small not very well known brewery so it, like to get someone to spend 20 30 40 quid with us it's still like it's a big risk for beers they're basically going off on what people have recommended or not so you know th there's so many good breweries out there if you've got 30 40 quid to spend you can go in the web shops of cloud water track verdant daya pomona duration beak whoever else like and you know it's going to be absolutely brilliant so for a relatively new brewery and 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 we look at as consumers ourselves like i've been in bottle shops can shops and seen like 440 mil dippers on shelf at nine pounds i'm like i'm not like i'm not gonna pay i'm, I'm sure it's brilliant but i'm not gonna pay that like nine pounds for a, a uk dipper like it's so we've i think we're 650 on ours and mm -hmm. yeah i wouldn't really want to go much beyond that at all because it's to me it's pushing it a lot like it's, it's a lot of money to ask for someone um i know we've got our overheads and our and our costs and our staff and things as well but we still want it to be affordable for for customers it's not cheap or supermarket cheap by any means but like relatively affordable for the industry yeah it's finding that balance isn't it yeah yeah it's finding the balance. yeah it is and it's, it's a tough one to tough one to walk like yeah make enough on it to sort of pay all the overheads and all these stuff and, and based on our scale we don't have the scales of bigger breweries but at the same time not like pricing people out and mm -hmm. yeah not making it that we're a real luxury product that you sort of can't afford yeah how are you guys are you getting on with that beer do you want to crack the um, next one happy to move happy to move yeah. on i'm done next one. you're done already <laughs> 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 this one's been moved to the country yeah move to the country <laughs> yeah i yeah. can't remember what this name is off so Ben's gonna um, to introduce this. I'm excited for this because this has got well two of me two of me four favourite hops in them, but one of which is my top hop. So I like what, what are your other what are your other two favourite hops out of interest? So there's these two and then Strata, and nice. then if I had to put it out potentially Idaho seven, but only when it not yeah. as the hop though. Only when it's yeah. other, you know what I mean. Like Idaho seven, yeah. being well impressed by it. Yeah, this is um, Citra Nelson Sovan DDH IPA. Um, like yeah, absolutely love Nelson. We've got a single hop cask beer. We just done Nelson all the way through it. Um, so yeah, we thought we sort of combined two of them. Um, I'll be honest, we have fairly big contracts and still Citra and Nelson Sovan as well. So it was a good chance to, uh, <laughs> to, to use some hops up if we needed to. Um, and we never actually tried, there was a combo, just the two of them. We've had them in with like other hops. So we thought we'll try both together. Yeah. So how would you hide the percentage so well? Cause that doesn't taste like, I know 6% isn't massive nowadays in the terms of yeah. in terms of craft, but there's not even a, a hint of it. It's like juice. It's literally yeah. like, to quote Rutan, who was in the Instagram page. It's like drinking J2O. <laughs> Yeah, we finished like a lot of our IPAs and dips mm -hmm. at the moment are finishing quite sweet and quite high. And I think that does take some of the perception, like the bitterness away and body and so forth. Um, but yeah, um, mainly finished a little bit higher. A lot of extra payout. Yeah, using mashing high, using de um, thingy dextrose as well, so it can a bit more fermentability as well. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. Pretty yeah, easy drinking for six percent. Yeah, I mean, so Nelson's my favourite hop. Um, yeah, Citra is probably second. So when I saw the hop profile of this, I knew it was going to be awesome anyway. But I mean, you get you get the typical Nelson stuff. Even just when you crack the can, the aroma wise, it's like you get that white grape vibe. Yeah, to it. yeah. Um, it's so distinct. It's like when you smell a Nelson beer, like it's yeah, amazing. Exactly, uh, exactly, and it, it comes through really well on the taste. But there's like a little bit of um kind of sound daft obviously it's syrup but like citrusy type notes coming through on the yeah, back yeah. after the that initial white grape flavor and it's, yeah, yeah that's really that's i'm really really enjoying that like I think yes thank you yeah it's um just 
50-50 all the way through Whirlpool and Dry Hop. Um, so yeah, we'll probably, yeah, I think probably we'll brew it again, no doubt. We kind of seem to have a little bit of a, like a very small core range at the moment, in essence, beach house, fog, and probably void space ratio or coffee stout. Mm -hmm. And then we seem to have this like range of like 30, 40 beers that we'll maybe brew a couple of times a year. I guess not just similar to like what Verdant do. Verdant have lots of beers they bring back out again and then sort of add a few more like one-offs in there. So like this will be a be one that we'll probably bring back later in the year or, or re-brew again. Awesome. This is peak summer for me, I think, drinking something something like this in a nice kind of like tap room environment. Yeah. Sun, sun bleaching down, you've got some sort of barbecue on the go, like it's that's dead easy because summer times are hard, a hard one to hit sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it's too hard to even too hot to even think. I know sometimes yeah. in the UK it's not, but you know what I mean? Like you just all you all you want is just to sit back with a nice lolly, but this is this is something like the nice lolly equivalent of a of a beer. You can drink yeah, it yeah. pretty much pretty much any time through the through the air. It's just so smooth, so easy drinking and yeah. I mean six six percent will sort you out, but it's it doesn't taste like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, definitely it's uh yeah, we've done a couple of, we've gone back down now again, we've got starting a few more pails, but yeah, it's a, it's a sort of last IPA. I think we're going to be doing more IPAs going forward, but we might, 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 yeah, might not be doing as many DDH ones. Um, we've got a couple of canning this week. We've got a, a California IPA we did with Marble. Um, we've got a sour IPA we've done as well, like just a, a dry hop sour IPA, and then um, looking to do maybe like a few, not quite west coast but more like bitterness less sort of juicy just classic ipas as we sort of call them yeah um i suppose yeah we've got a couple of hot varieties we're going to try on like a classic ipa um be interested like, what, what do you guys think in terms of we're sort of debating a bit here like the softness versus we've started to like crave bitterness a little bit more again now like it's it's a hard one isn't it i think there's been that much haze over the past you know well however long it's been and I, as I absolutely love hazy IPA and you know double IPAs and all that type of stuff but I'm also I absolutely love the west coast as well yeah like Bernie's Flex that you guys did with Cloudwater was one of my favorite UK west coasts that I've drank yeah. and um, it's like I'm on it these guys know I'm on an absolute lager and west coast freight train at the minute just trying yeah. to <laughs> Like I've drunk that much haze over the past year, yeah. and I still enjoy them, and I still drink them, and I still yeah. drink the doubles and the triples and stuff. It's uh, I'm enjoying those bitter or yeah, yeah, beer potentially or the old school IPAs just to kind of break it up a little bit. Yeah, I know we're, we're almost ex exactly the same here at the moment. So we've got yeah California IPA in tank, we've got a West Coast Pale in tank. I'm wondering if a West Coast Dipper. We started like drinking like drier beers in essence and bitter ones again. Like yeah. We, there's something about the most makes them as much as this say it's like gets you wanting back for more something about that bitterness that makes them so drinkable so mm. yeah i think it's i hate to say like comebacks west coast's been around for a while but i think <laughs> we're probably gonna see more and more this this summer yeah no i agree my into uh like the craft beer world was um kind of west coast that kind of assault you on the way down like they'll punch you in the face before you can drink it yeah uh, with the hops and, and bitterness and I, I don't think I can ever get tired of it, but I think it's quite yeah. a good blessing that we do try a lot of different beers just in the nature yeah. of like our Instagram posts. And it, it's it's really good for, for me so I don't get fatigued from the beer that I like. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. gives you a, a little bit of a little bit of everything. And yeah. it's, I think it's a good, a good way to drink and not yeah. saying people can't t do their own choices, but if you, fo if you follow a beer account or something, just fo follow their steps and try and do it because it, it does work in like a nice... Yeah. random way that that is, is quite nice but yeah. i don't, don't know about good about gray where's where's your uh where's your hop hop level at at the minute like you say just mixing it up i think there's times when kind of crack a rest of coast and it's like not really feeling the bitterness of it and that punch and you know, i probably would have preferred but I, I just go to the fridge and i just pick out whatever can comes to hand to be honest. <laughs> yeah. uh, just close um, your eyes and grab one. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. As long as it's not a pastry start, because that one just keeps going back. Like, yeah. Back, back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if I was craving kind of like a really kind of dank IPA, I'll, I'll go for it. But 
Yeah. Usually, I just I just like to pick and choose. It's a lucky dip, really. Um, nice. Good. Good but, way to but be. Then, obviously, there's always there's always a time and a place for a lager. I kind of feel. Yeah. It's, it always resets it, and you kind of forget how good lagers can be. Yeah. And, and something like the British ones, like the stuff like Don Zoko doing, is amazing. So, yeah. um, duration been banging out some cracking lagers, and like Ed, like most most UK breweries seem to be having like a like a, a go at it now and I think it's only gonna like only gonna improve. Like I know we we've done hours but we sort of did century of our lago and we're like, yeah, yeah, it needs to be drier and, and more bitter and more drinkable and crisper and it's yeah, it's exciting for it to sort of and then we, we test our lager, benchmarked it against other British lagers as well. So and they were like trying a few of those, they were like phenomenal. So like, okay, this is this is where we need to get to. No, definitely. I think at the end of the day, you know, realistically, when people start drinking beer, they all start with, you probably all start with lagers down the pub, don't you? Before yeah. You get into craft. So it's, it's, it's class to go back to your roots and yeah. start drinking more lagers and stuff. Like I've done, I've, I've, I've had a couple of your home pills now. I've had, um, I've done a few Greybrook orders, Utopian. Uh, order and I've had a load of a load of Don's local coffee there. Yeah, yeah. relatively yeah. local to us, and um, so they're they're in quite a few bottle shops around ours. And it's just there's no better than just sitting and cracking a proper crisp. Yeah. Lager, is there? You know what I mean? It's just so it gets yeah. you, it makes you want to go back to the fridge and get another. Yeah, it's funny. My um my my brother's work like living over here now, but he was living in Australia and he came back like a couple of years ago. He's working for a brewery out there and they're mainly doing like hazy beers and pastry stouts and went out for his birthday in York. I think we're like House of Trembling Madness, like drinking loads of like hazy beers and stuff. And I could see him like fading from all the hops. <laughs> and he's like, I just, it's like, I just don't fancy a, a, like, um, I don't fancy a hoppy beer. And I got him in like an Augustina because he'd been in Australia, he'd never tried it before. Mm -hmm. And like his eyes, when he tried it, it's like, it's incredible. <laughs> like, I was like, just drinking lager again. He's like, it's amazing. And just like, look for it everywhere he went after that. Definitely. No, I know. If, um, this is, if you guys had to introduce someone into craft beer, yeah. what, not necessarily what particular beer, because that might be too hard to pinpoint, but like, what, what style would you give someone? Because I always think, oh, well, you could give them a pale, like, for yeah. instance, like, like a hazy pale. Or could you go down a like a West Coast pale, or would you do a craft yeah. lager? Or, you know what I mean? It's it's yeah, it's tough, isn't it? Because it's I guess that's what's so good about beer is that you can basically you can cover everything off. Like yeah. that, that maybe wine to an extent can't offer the sort of range of flavors you can offer, and anything from a a wit to a like a West Coast dipper to a pastry stout. So I guess for an entry. I think it's something that's not maybe too malty. I always think, I think a lot of people are put off by the malt, excess malt in beers and, you know, like the old cask kind of trad yeah. cask and which I know some people, you know, it's got a following, but I think it can, yeah, people can find it a little bit too heavy yeah. kind of thing or. Yeah, because um, I guess you're first getting into it, I guess that, that bitterness as well can put a lot of people off the first time to try really, Bitter beer. Um, and that's a tough question. It probably will be something pale, something yeah. pale, easy, yeah, sessionable, uh, not too bitter, uh, soft and easy. Yeah, not a, <laughs> not a lambic or anything. You know? <laughs> 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 it's a lambic, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. Um, I don't know. I was like, sort of chatting the other night about favourite beers and like Allagash White's one of my favourite. Mm. Like, spent a bit of time over there. You know, you've been over there. It's such an, a a really amazing drinkable beer with so many different flavors in it in terms of like the hot profile and the coriander and the orange and then the wheat flavor and i mean that could be a great entry beer for someone getting into it um and we have to we found here before we had a lager on tap is that saisons or grisettes um like maybe a so he said um, stereotypical lager drinker but people who sort of drank mass lager would come here and not see a lager option would try a saison Mm -hmm. over like a pale ale because it didn't have that in your face hoppiness yeah it gave that drinkability interesting about mm -hmm. on the other 
and Taff, and he went straight into. Oh, so, yeah. Was it Duchess? Uh, yeah, like sours. Like I've Duchess seen a couple of people the first time. They try like a, yeah. a kettle sour. Um, my first time when I was first getting to beer, I tried a kettle sour. I was like, oh, this is horrific. And then gradually I liked it. And then we had like a friend of ours the first time yeah. he tried Siren Calippo. He's like, this is incredible. It's like, That's, it's oh, like yeah. lilt. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. It's people's tastes. Is, yeah. So, yeah, it's bizarre. Different. And, yeah. Yeah. We spoke to Vol City and he said, if you're not a beer drinker, he said sours are kind of a way to go. Um, yeah. If you're a bit of a, say, a cider drinker or something, it's quite a, a nice kind of movement yeah. in. It's, it's kind of similar on that kind of palate. But that yeah. that, that Calico um, from Siren, I think I described it as like drinking a melted down Calico ice lolly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice, nice and sweet, straight down, and there's, there's, there's no yeah. bother with it at all. Yeah, yeah. No, I think we answered the question there. I can't quite tell whether we're going to answer or not. The first beer to get into. I do. I do have a kind of question that's going to step slightly away from the beer, and it's more to do with <laughs> yeah. kind of like the farm and stuff like that. So obviously yeah. you've 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 diversified a little bit, and you've gone into making the tap room, and you've got like a camping site. How did how did that kind of come about? What was what was the idea kind of behind doing it? Was it just you wanted you seeing how the industry was kind of working, and you wanted a piece of it, or was there was there anything else that was behind that? Yeah, we. Probably a couple of things, wasn't it? Like we um, were brewing in like previously a really small three barrel brewery. Um, and then we um, we spoke to like a local distillery who we're pretty close with um, and they got a rural diversification grant, which they're sort of offering to farms and things in terms of creating employment and you sort of get EU investment to, um, to get like, they, they fund up to like 40% of a project. Um, yeah. It's about the time, you, Mick was sort of taking over the farm. Yeah, we were original. We were uh, we did uh, milk. We were a dairy farm for about I think for forty years, over forty years. Um, and didn't I was taking over from my parents um, eighteen months ago, and couldn't really do it on my own. Um, and we didn't really like the way where the industry was going. Where the dairy, it's, it's quite ruthless. Um, it's uh, we thought we thought the brewery would be a, yeah. quite a well, yeah, similar kind of. Well, it's a kind, of, it's, it's it's kind of the we had the room kind of thing, and it would fit and it yeah. would work with what we were. This is what we're planning on doing, and sort of time. How hard did it change from dairy to to focus on what? I'm, I'm sure you you do your own. Did you do your own malts or? Uh, beef now. No, we're, yeah, we're, we're beef. We're beef farm now, but it's been oh, right, scaled okay. down so. Um, everything, yeah. So the cattle numbers have gone down, so that's given us allowed us a bit more room on the farm. A few more buildings have come up. Obviously, this one and where the brewery is now, there was calves um, in that. That was probably about two years ago. Yeah, it's, it's sort of um, the decision I guess you make on farming. You basically make nothing unless it's a really big operation. Um, that's sort of the route. You sort of didn't want to go down to. No, um, that you look at. Yeah, you, so we sort of scaled back on, on the herd and things and looked to, like, got the a smallest campsite and a bit of like horse livery and stuff, but it's sort of adding something else to it. I guess mm -hmm. something that I had a, had a passion for as well. Yep. Um, and something that when we're very fortunate, the location we're in, something completely unique, a really cool place to be. I'm I'm mega impatient. I wanted a couple of years ago just to get like a random shop front in Chorley and open the tap room there. And Mick was like, hang on, he was like, it'll be worth it. Well, there'll be buildings on the farm. Um, and we're also sort of reticent. Will you know? Will anyone actually bother turning up to Rivington in a November, like when it's raining sideways, to, to come and drink our beer? Um, and if I'm honest, the first winter, not a lot did turn up. But then <laughs> gradually, as spring and summer came around and stuff, um, yeah, the yeah. word spread. We've always been quite a word of mouth kind of brewery yeah. um, tap room as well. So it did take yeah. a few, like six months, didn't it, really, for it to? Yeah, we're not in your face kind of thing. Um, yeah. But no, it's like, I guess, yeah. adding sort of another, another business and one, have a bit more of like a, a passion and a, and a drive for as well. Like mm, the mil so. Milking's twice a day, every day, 365 days a year. It's like, it's a pretty labor intensive job. Um, so brewing seems like a walk in a park now compared to, <laughs> <laughs> compared to milking. I would say so. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's cool as hell that the tappies on the, uh, on the farm, like, I think that's great. I mean, yeah. the last we are we are definitely going to make the trip, and we are going to come and uh, <clears throat> come and sit in your tap room and drink some booze, like because yeah. it's 
like tap rooms are, I think tap rooms are class anyway. Like it, there's something yeah. different compared from a tap room compared to like a bar or a pub. I think yeah. the tap room feels a little bit more authentic and you're drinking the beer that's, you know, brewed there. Yeah. But I think the fact that yours is like on a farm and everything as well, I just think that's, that's cool as fuck, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're pretty like lucky our location. We're only on the train half an hour from, or plus like half an hour walk from Manchester. Mm -hmm. Preston, we're only 10, 15 minutes away in the train again, but it's like half an hour walk up to the farm. So yeah, we are. We're still, even though we're, we're rural and scenic, we're pretty accessible still. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Awesome. awesome. I guess we're just while we're on <clears throat> and the farmer things, I know it's on your website, you kind of very much about local kind of produce, local ingredients, that sort of thing. Is there any kind of local ingredient which you particularly like to brew with or anything which you kind of, yeah, you grow yourselves. Obviously, you mentioned you're a, you're a yeah. farm, so I don't imagine you've got a lot of arable crops there. But yeah, just thought it'd be interesting. So we we grown grown hops before, which we put in our stock ale. Uh, we're actually planting a few more hops this year, but mm, it'll be a few years. It, and it's a pretty terrible climate for hops. Like it's it's wet and cold, and not much sunshine here. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so we've done hops. Um, we've got a lot of elderflower, which is one we want to start start foraging and, and using yeah. a bit as well. Um, I personally, I really like um, chili stouts, so I want to start growing some chilies at some point because it's not they don't take up a huge amount of room chilies compared to like growing something else. But I'd have to be like a, in a greenhouse or something. Um, yeah, we do. I mean, we're clay soil around here, so we can't really grow fruit or. Pretty good at growing spuds or something like that, but yeah. that's probably about uh, DDH potato <laughs> pepper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, down about, some trees and yeah. stuff. But, so. when, you, when you're talking there about chilies and stuff, you did a, um, a port with chili, uh, cherry and habanero, wasn't it? Yeah, with uh, uh, Runaway and Devil Dog. One of the um, one of the lads off Instagram said, any. He messaged just straight back and said, please tell them I mean this in a nice way. Yeah. <laughs> he really enjoyed it. But he said, like, where was where was your head off when you came with, came <laughs> with, with that combination? <laughs> uh, when, well, we were sort of, because um, Mark at Runaway did one, he did a amazing, like, smoked porter with a uh, chipotle in it. Mm -hmm. And ironically, last, because last summer we didn't have, the bigger brewery in so we were doing crowlers basically like hand filling crowlers the whole time we've got some kegs off running away and that chipotle porter like i probably drank 75 percent of the keg on my own like i just thought it was absolutely amazing like i love that spice at the back of your throat um so it's for sulfur uh independent sulfur beer festival for the virtual one we did a collab with runaway i like chatting to mark about it and we've got liam from devil dog hot sauces involved like me and Mark had a, like we had a few ideas going back, and then Liam just came in, and he used to be like head chef at Hawksmoor, which is like a really good restaurant down here. And he just steamed in with like, right, you need to pair this and pair this and try this and do this together. So, yeah, eventually settled on sour cherry and habanero. Um, but if you ever tried his hot sauces, they're like, yeah, he pairs all sorts of strange stuff together. Um, but yeah, I want to, I want to, I want to do an MP spice style at some point like i really like them but they're fairly niche so <laughs> need to wait a little bit yeah just do it do it as a small batch i'm sure it'll be all right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> middle of summer yeah middle of summer <laughs> middle of july yeah. <laughs> 20 degrees <laughs> yeah. are, you, um, are you lads ready to practice yeah let's, let's go, go for it yeah good to go dip a time dip a time go on then i'll let you guys i'll let you guys introduce this Going straight to bed after um, this one, like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we, um, yeah, we started with a couple of dippers on our old brewery, um, but something we wanted to get into, but like do a few more of them. So we did a collaboration with Chain House, which is our first one, which was Evil Dead 2. Um, and then it's, sort of become a bit evolving did blood machines after that um and now on hills have eyes um so yeah we're gonna i guess carry on every sort of dip we've done where well, we change the hot bill but sort of change the malt a little bit or change the water chemistry so it's a little bit of a evolving thing is doing dippers every you know once a month or so every six weeks and sort of trying to improve them as we go along 
or, or learn more about it. That's cool, man. That is a uh, that's soft. That's a soft soft dipper, but it's it's really really well balanced as well. That's uh, yeah. But it's, it's, it's alongside it being super soft and super pillowy, it's really really bold, and the flavours are quite like in your face, but in a good way. You know yeah. what I mean? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That's really really. But, um, I absolutely. Yeah, Sorry, I absolutely adored Blood Machines. I thought it was yeah. spectacular, and this is, yeah, this is this is awesome, man. Yeah, so we um, we scaled back. We sort of went El Dorado leave with this. Um, I'll be honest, we we used El Dorado from one hop supplier. Um, the hops are all right, but when we're, our current contract run now with someone else, like the quality of hops is completely different. Like. Beach House, we used like last bar mosaic cup of our previous supplier. Our latest batch has the new supplier in, and the quality that they run was just night and day. So, as we start to get these hops in, um, I think we'll sort of improve it. Like our dip is even more like the Idaho 7 on this was from the new supplier, the Eldorado was the old one. So, when we can start, like we never, I don't think we really appreciated the difference in hop quality until this year between sort of two suppliers and it's yeah it's absolutely night and day like how how much difference they are so yeah we've got another one planned for like three weeks i think mm. time um actually not brewing it or two weeks for brewing i think um so yeah i'm gonna, gonna mix up the hops and that a little bit and try a few we've not used before awesome yeah that's uh that's lush that large what do you think of it that's, uh... The East Coast is quite smooth. Um, for me, I get a little bit of wine in it. Uh, where yeah. it's, yeah, it's, uh, and it's, it's not quite kind of what I expected. Uh, so I'm probably going to take a little while to get used to it. But uh, <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's really smooth. Uh, yeah. so it's probably, yeah, I'll drink it in no time and probably change my mind when I'm quite <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good, yeah, it's a good like, progression that we've had, like, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we found this one like a little bit more boozy than previous versions. Just something we're gonna we've sort of looked at the next recipe how we how we change that a little bit. Um, and you're also the hop selection like it's what pairs well at this ABV and stuff. We're uh, yeah learning a little bit about. Yeah. Yeah. How much is it? How much is it always like you you kind of reflecting on? Because obviously you you you'll drink your own stuff. Do you listen to maybe is what people say, mm. or is it is it mainly what you guys go? You know what? I don't think that's right, and then you make something you think it's right, or it work, or it doesn't work for other people. What 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 happens there? Well, we do a yeah, we do a sensory, don't we? Every month with the with the team, yeah. Um, whereas we kind of compare them to other breweries, so, so we do a bit of a tasting. Yeah, so kind we, of we blind taste it next to other breweries, and then get everyone. And it's it's hard we get there get better like give honest feedback on where we actually think our beers stand up um there's been times where like beach house we yeah. where we did beach house and i think it was sonoma and cloud waters pale that we did it blind against and we thought the aroma on the, on the previous batch was like nowhere near the, those guys so um because the core beer we brew it quite a lot we've now got it in tank again with with the new hops and we sort of knew where that issue was a bit um and then, but yeah, we are, we are super critical and I think you have to be, and we want to be, to sort of be, be the best to keep improving what we're doing. Like, you know, Sam self defeatist, we're never completely happy with anything we do. Uh, and a lot of the time fridge at home isn't filled with like ribby beers, it's other breweries beers. Cause I'm like, oh yeah, I'll try them at home and think, oh, these are, these are way better than what we're producing, but that's, yeah. I, never want us to sort of be a complacent brewery like it's it's mm. fun to to want to improve all the time and it might only be little bits but yeah there's absolutely no sort of resting our laurels it's want to make stuff better all the time who do you see yourselves um like at the same level as at the minute if, that's if, that's, if that's a, <laughs> a fair thing to say yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. that's tough because it's like it's easy to say like who we see is way above I me. Mean, look at like what cloud water doing and tracker doing guys like that like it's sort of way above well i guess for this style of beer we think sort of way ahead um even stuff i've had from beak i think 
as I know they're not a new brewery because it's been different for a while, but a guy who's been on his own kit. And I guess in essence, we've been on our bigger brewery since July last year. Their quality is absolutely amazing. Like the sort of softness, the, the flavors, the aroma, the drinkability they're getting from their pails is absolutely like phenomenal. So yeah, I think that they're sort of definitely ahead. Um, on a level, I don't, I don't know really. It's, um, it's quite a hard one to answer. I don't know if, well, I, if, it, if I say if it, it, if it works out, them or whether they're going to be happy with it. So. <laughs> if it works out better, who is the one that you want to do a collab with? Is it going to be someone that's going to be similar to you or is it going to be somebody who does something completely different? Oh, it'd be something completely different. Yeah. I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I don't know. We've got, we've got a few, a couple lined up. What this year already? Um, doing one weeks, doing one drop projects, um, doing a wild horse, and then Pomona and Squawk. We're going to do two with those guys. Cause they sort of did one of us last year. Yeah. Um. So the one, the one we're going to brew at Pomona, if it comes off, should be pretty mega. Hopefully. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's, yeah, it's, yeah, there's the, the mixed firm side of stuff. Like I adore and I'd, I'd love to, and we want to invest some time and money in it here as well, but it's going to take a bit of time and sort of a bit more learning and to do it properly. So someone who absolutely like nails that side of it. I mean, it's like a small, like what Burning Sky are doing, like for the quality of beers they produce. And consistently produce year after year, and aren't sort of rated high, or aren't seen as high, or aren't seen as a flash in a pan. Like that's someone you, you can learn, learn loads off. I think Colonel will be a good shot. Colonel, yeah, as well. Colonel beers, yeah, yeah. Colonel, Colonel, beers. Colonel the class. Love, it's admiration for, for like, yeah, the, the variety of styles as well. I think that's such a a good testament to a brewery's quality that they can not just pales, but mixed firm and brown ales and lagers and whatever else and. I think it's, it's a sign of, of, of where a brewery's getting to. You look at like Cloudwater's output the last year, they've turned their hands to so many styles now and doing so many so well. It's not just hazy pails anymore. And it's something we're, we're constantly trying to do here as well. Like again, with, with so many taps on, we didn't want people to come here and there'd be 17 taps of pale IPA and dipper. So mm. it's consciously made us brew red ales uh, and brew porters and stouts and we've got like a whip beer coming and got Same. saisons coming mm -hmm. uh, we've had stock ales and stuff in the past we've got lager so it's yeah it's making us want to brew and, and continue to brew sort of different styles mm -hmm. yeah no, i understand that what would you see like what's your favorite style to brew and what to be honest as well what's your favorite style to drink because obviously i'm guessing you prefer brewing the type of style you prefer to drink. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, um, drink for me is still saisons and stuff, <laughs> or, or like like wits, or like I st yeah, some sort of drinkability. But then I've, I've, it's ironic I've not drank a lot of them recently, so I still yeah, probably saisons and sort of easy pails to brew. Um, I like brewing stouts. I like the all sort of the malts that go in and all the the aroma mm. and yeah what you can do with them and stuff as well is, is brilliant so i think brewing something new quite enjoy yeah um but as, as, as a style i kind of my palate changes i always think throughout the year i think you know to drink something four percent in summer i drink dippers more in winter and in stouts and yeah it kind of changes your life seasonal in my kind of yeah. it's flip it on its head what don't you like drinking <laughs> or is there anything <laughs> that you don't like drinking <laughs> um i don't like milkshake ipas sorry even though i was finished really sweet um i've just yeah we were going to brew one like three years ago when i think they first came out um and we're like right we need to keep up band on bang on trend we need to do a milkshake ipa like they're all the rage and then we sort of stop we're like look that yeah we don't enjoy them so we shouldn't we shouldn't brew one. I mean, again, to each their own. Like, I can see why there's a market for them. I see why people enjoy them and stuff. But like, yeah, not, not for us. Much. Yeah, I mean, I don't like um, pastry stout personally. Uh, yeah. It doesn't work for my taste buds essentially. But I can completely understand why people go 
absolutely mental for them, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's just one of those things. What's your two yeah. lads? Yeah. What are you two lads not like drinking? Because we've not had this conversation before. Yeah, I thought you were going to say Sabro, because <laughs> Sabro is your evil hop, isn't it? Uh, dippers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <Maybe too. laughs> um, I don't know. I th- I'm kind of on the same same wavelength as Ben. Like the, I, I don't really get the milkshakey like kind of things. Like, uh, just doesn't sit with us quite well. Like things that are overly sweet. Um, if if it's not balanced out with something, it, it, it's not gonna not gonna really sit well with me. So I kind of stay away from those. Um, been pushing my way through a bit more Belgians and getting a bit better at drinking those and pushing through that. Uh, summer ace, summer just too much for me at the minute, but I'm I'm getting there. Alex, uh, <clears throat> it always used to be kind of porters and stouts until this Christmas just gone when I decided I'm just gonna drink a porter like no matter what and a stout and I just got into them and I love them. Uh, but it's probably, yeah, like the Belgian side of things, like the more multi kind of star beers. I just, I just don't quite, I just don't quite agree with my palate yet. But it's probably going to be the next thing which is going to force into me and I will probably end up loving them. Yeah. I think, uh, Ben and Mike might have froze. Do you think so, guys? Are they there? They're still there? Yeah. I think you can hear them. <laughs> it's like <laughs> on and off a little bit, like. I want to get them back before we. Uh, Are you back? Oh, back. Are you there, back? Go. there we go. Yeah. That's it. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. We were saying, um, we we're saying trying to, trying to drink my way into like Roush beers, smoke beers a bit more. Like, I don't like a little bit of a, a smoke character, I don't mind, but then lots. I, yeah, I'm still like. The first club I ever did was with Tour Side and they churn out smoke beers for fun. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I could get into it. I mean, lads, have you, have you got any other questions for, uh, for Ben and Mike before we, before we finish? Because I'm just going to end on one question and then... I'll oh, go for it then. Go yeah. for it. Alex, anything before we go? Uh, so, so, I noticed it, I guess, I was, I was just going through your website. Uh, earlier and this you got seem to have quite a lot of uh, kind of local pubs around you which uh, are, are big fans and kind of I see big pushes of your beer a lot of uh, locals who go there who, who love buying your beers do you kind of see there's a bit of a shift in the pub industry probably a bit of probably a huge question um, shifting the pub industry away from those major breweries towards either independence and seeing kind of breweries like yourselves I know we've got Plenty of breweries up here and kind of independent pubs now. Uh, do you feel like there's a shift in, in that direction? In I guess with pubs. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean we our like the nearest pub to us, for instance, uh Bay Horse, like classic old pub, like absolutely stunning, but it's enterprise run. So for us to get our beer into there, it's only what, what I've been told through beer flex, I think they'll pay a maximum of fifty-eight. 60 pound a nine um our cheapest nine is 88 pounds i think and then that can that's that's you know, then gets sold to the pub about 120 quid a nine which is sort of the middle man has taken so they're just the pubs can't buy in any sort of innovative new beer um so i think it's a role that the, the pub codes are going to face like we being rural we we sort of it's wasn't always easy for us to get a hold of good beer, but we had some really good places close by, like Bunbury's and Bolton, um, mm. who's been going from pretty much about the same time we started, like phenomenal little place. Mm. And then recently, like Plug and Taps in Preston and Market Ale House. Um, but like with Bunbury's, I think it's the micro pub scene, the independent scene, he's, he's doing amazingly well, but you're in such a, a small footprint there. Like his, it's in essence like a shop front his, his sort of place fits about 30 people um so th- i'm hoping I'm, th- I'm hoping after all this the big thing we'll see is a shift back to sort of pubs being leased free of tie or sold off because i can't see how the pub codes are going to continue like when they're not getting footfall through the door and the sort of the landlords know how expensive the beer costs through the pub group. Like, what what is their value anymore? And, and their value as a pub group will only be, I guess, the estate that they hold. Like, actually holding, owning physical physical buildings. So, 
I'm hoping we'll see more of a, a shift to free of Thai pubs. And then, well, we were saying about, I mean, Preston near, what, 20 miles away from Preston. And that's been a completely change onto the scenery there. Yeah, yeah. How many craft bars and, you know, and yeah, it's bottle like, shops there are and there's plug in there. And yeah, well, when we, we first started, like 75% of our beer percent went to Manchester. And now our biggest market is Preston by far. Like we've got between cool. like plug and taps and plow. The Orchard, Moorbrook, mm. Continental. I'm trying to name names I can about offending anyone there. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they're they're in the Leyland as well, which yeah. is close to it. Um, yeah. But that's that's right. only four years. I think it's four years since we yeah. started. It's, it's just, yeah, that's, that's been a big thing. That, well, they're bringing up your lads as well. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it's like proper robotic. Very lads breaking up. It's that rural, rural Wi-Fi. I think is uh, what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get the stuff. <laughs> Might have to kick him and put him back in, see how that works. No. Still going on. <laughs> the, the choice is you, mate. Eh? <laughs> oh, oh, can I wait? Uh, I think we're back. Can go back and see if people are they, are they back yet? Yeah. Yep. Go around. Quite quickly. I've gone. <laughs> They'll come back, they'll come back, don't worry. I think, I think I they're quite good um, how, how the kind of pubs and stuff are working because there's quite a lot of, with, with my line of work with spirits and stuff, there's quite a lot of pubs that are always just like, I make two pence a pint on on most things because the, the middleman does charge like a crazy amount. Yeah. And there was a guy who I uh, was dealing with and he was paying like 115, 100, 120 pound a keg of Foster's and he was making two pence a pint. And he was like, I need, I need your spirits to, to help us do and we can change it. But if, if it can kind of find a way for a craft to jump into a bar or something like that, it's definitely going to help, definitely going to help A, the brewery and B, the bar owner. And hopefully the, the punters are there for, yeah. to, to, to pay that kind of money, but hopefully it is. Sorry, lads, it <laughs> kind of went it's super really bottom there. Like. <laughs> 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 that, uh, that rural Wi-Fi. Yeah. No, we're saying like we've seen a big shift to drinking habits like rurally and sort of the rural towns around us and places like like Preston. Um, so yeah, like it's, I think the the micro pub industry almost has sort of followed the beer industry and in that there was like like the brewery industry. There's there's loads and loads and loads of brewery openings and then that's sort of slowed down now and you're getting the guys that are starting now are starting with like big budgets and really quality output. And I think probably the micro pub industry will follow the same route that you'll see less and less micros opening, but then suddenly when people do open, it's going to be, okay, so a, a bigger, better scale instead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, or get, or buying the, or sort of renting the old pubs for your time. Yeah. It's interesting. It's, yeah. Well, so it's a big thing. Like the, the British pub culture is, uh, like it's, it's revered, isn't it? Like you look at some of the quality of the old buildings and, and the history of them and things. It like it should be a shame to those to be lost. Um like it's it's something that, you know, when like American breweries come over here and drink cask in like old two, three hundred year old pubs, like it's something that's revered and um yeah, I hope it should be should be protected, but it needs to sort of be be protected in like a sustainable way for, for whoever's running the pub and, and for people selling beer to it. No, I mean, obviously like, these lads will know, and I, I don't know if you guys have been out in Newcastle on that before, but Newcastle's got so many, like, beautiful pubs, and, and yeah. uh, you know, it's just, it is, it's amazing, so I know, exa I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. yeah, but they sort of bar the the history and the interior, they lack a reason to go there, because, again, our local pub is Carling on Draft, Wayne Wright's on Cask pretty much nothing else like what is your reason to go there other than <laughs> like it's a cozy old pub yeah like i mean i've been there i've lived here seven years i've been there twice i think 
Like, and it's, <laughs> it's a walking distance from, from where I live and we're pretty rural. So, yeah, I think, I think consumers will drive it a lot as well. I think sort of consumers saying what they want to drink and what they want in the pubs will hopefully push it. Yeah. Must be getting close to the cut off time for electricity, I think. Well, <laughs> no. I might be losing them again. Yeah. Sorry. They're back. All right. back. All right. All right. We're in still in here, then I think they're going to drop back. <laughs> I only want to know what their favourite meal deal is. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> well, after, you know what this calls for. We're just going to have to go down and film something there. I know. Yeah, that's, that's what uh, it is. Well, <laughs> okay. we'll let them uh, we'll let them drop off and come back, and then we'll uh, we'll finish up. But yeah, no, I completely understand what he means about the pubs and stuff because you guys know in Newcastle there's some absolute serious serious <laughs> pubs. Back <laughs> <But again. laughs> no, Is he there? Hello. <laughs> oh, you gotta love Zoom, dude. Yeah, Zoom. Oh, technology nowadays, man. It's technology. <laughs> You'd think during lockdown, people would have got their Wi Fi back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think, like they're like saying, there's, there's plenty of old pubs that we know about, and it's great to have that kind of heritage and, and have those old buildings and, and where it kind of not all kind of started from because it appears yeah. and be as an ancient thing, but to have, have somewhere that's an old style place that does great craft beer is a bit more special than having some nice new shiny hut that, that has only been going a year and, it, and it's been doing all the all the crazy good hot um, um craft beer that's great but it's it's not as not as good as drinking a proper nice good craft beer in an old school pub that character that everything i think i think i see it feels sense. like places like lady grace i think they're, they're completely right they're, the, the fact that consumers are going to uh, drive it, and I think we can see that you see that in pubs like well, you see it on Gossip High Street, you've got like the Browning Arms, things like that, who have gone that way as well. But we're on a phone this time, I think. I think, yeah, they're back. A couple laptops, so we've gone to the Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> we're a bit appalled at like how good our uh, video quality is on phone versus the laptop, so <laughs> <laughs> buy a new laptop at some point. I was just saying during lockdown, you think people might have sorted their Wi Fi out? <laughs> oh, honestly, it's dreadful here. <laughs> no, so we'll, we'll finish up because I know, um, I know obviously time's getting on. And stuff. So there was one question on the last podcast that a follower chucked at us, and I thought it was a class question. So I'm going to continue it going forward. So what's you, it's completely unbeer related as well. So what, what's your go to meal deal? <laughs> oh. Good question. Well, any, any meal do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I like I love a Big Mac meal, large. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man after me one heart. Doesn't like milkshake <laughs> IPAs, yeah. but I have a milkshake from McGinnies. Yeah. Six, six, <laughs> six nuggets on the side. Six nuggets on the side. Yeah, decent. Yeah, that's uh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mike, what about you? The same. Yeah, definitely yeah. Big Mac for me. Um, if we're going lunch meal deal. Um, I don't know, Tesco BLT. Yes. Fair, fair, yeah. fair. Nice. Maybe some Monster Munch. Innocent oh. Smoothie. That'll do oh. it. <laughs> Always Monster Munch. <laughs> you've, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to take them to the cleaners, man. You've got to go for the expensive items. <laughs> it's all £3. <laughs> <laughs> Most expensive. <laughs> right. Uh, that um, are you guys lads got any more questions or are you are you happy there? No, I think thank you. Awesome, Ben, Mike, you've been absolute fucking legends, lads. I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak to you today. And uh, for having us. Yeah, anytime, man. Honestly, anytime, and we'll see you at that tappy soon. Yeah, I look uh, forward to. It. And thank you, everyone, for listening. As always, cheers. Peace out. <laughs>